Okay, so my name is yes, so my name is Igor Smirnyev. I'm doing research at the University of Maryland, and I'm also working for a small company and actually I formed the company, Sultan LLC. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, well, photons and waveguides, and can we uh, study interesting physics uh, using the system, but. Uh, uh, let me start with uh, this introductory slide. Of course, I don't know how many of you followed uh, developments in optical metamaterials, but at least like, you know, in the beginning of 2000, they were in the news quite a lot. People did uh, very interesting things like invisibility clocks, they violated uh, diffraction limit. So I participated in this work a lot. Some of these headlines are actually talking about my work. But uh, actually, uh, the very interesting thing about um, um, optics of metamaterials and the closely related transformation optics is that basically we are using tools borrowed from general relativity. And the idea is actually quite simple, basically introduced by John Penry a while back. So uh, basically, uh, you know, when we are talking about light propagating in a medium in some kind of curvilinear uh, way, uh, we actually have a choice. We can say that, well, uh, in fact, light goes uh, all this goes uh, through the medium along a straight line, and then it just uh, the medium itself uh, creates a curvature of the optical space. So basically, uh, one way to look at it is to say that, well, uh, the special distribution of epsilon and mu creates some kind of curvilinear optical space. And then basically, light as always just follows straight path, it's just the space-time is curvilinear. And again, mathematical formalism is actually quite similar, and at some point people started to create optical black holes and even uh, fancy structures. Uh, uh, for instance, green leaf and collaborators introduced like uh, uh, metamaterial geometry, which was equivalent to optical wormhole. <laughs> uh, in one of my later papers, I demonstrated that you can create a metamaterial uh, distribution which, which would emulate a uh, warp drive. Uh, and of course, optics of metamaterials is actually even you know, richer, even, even more interesting than uh, conventional general relativity because uh, basically you can uh, create space time, so effective space times, which would have like more than one temporal dimension. And, or, you know, you can uh, make your special coordinate behavior times, so like in a hyperbolic metamaterial. And I will tell you in the next slide how you would make it. The wave equation looks like this. And epsilon one in this case would be negative. So basically, uh, you create a metric which would. Uh, in which uh, basically the special Z coordinate behaves as if it's a temporal coordinate. So uh, of course, with this flexibility, you can do very interesting things. And by the way, uh, the way to create a hyperbolic metamaterial is actually quite simple. You can start with, uh, let's say, uh, an array of metal nanowires, then along the wire, uh, the effective epsilon would be negative uh, uh, because the y is conductive and perpendicular to the y, it would be positive. In a like the nonlayer geometry, the situation would be different along the layers, it would be negative and perpendicular to the layers, it would be positive. But uh, what is happening, in fact, in such a situation, if you look at the dispersion law of photons in such a medium, uh, you would see no diffraction limits. So your K vector can be arbitrarily large. And this is like a representation of the dispersion law of photons in a hyperbolic medium, it's like two hyperboloids, that's why the name. Uh, 
And actually, the wavelength of photon in such a medium can be arbitrarily small, which will be important for us. And I'll tell you about it in the next slides. So uh, what would you do with a hyperbolic metamaterial? Well, you can create a model of Big Bang, a toy model of a Big Bang. So you can create a kind of uncentric uh, arrangement of layers in which the radial coordinate will be a like, time-like coordinate. So you can literally launch photons into the middle of the structure and uh, lights emanating from this uh, original point would behave like word lines of different stars galaxies after the Big Bang. Again, so very interesting way. I mean, you know, you can make a light do very strange things. But uh, of course, the question is, OK, well, you know, uh, how close we can get to a real story with such models. So apparently, light experiences quite interesting um, kind of space-time, effective space-time uh, curvature. Very interesting, um, very interesting uh, in metrical space, uh, of optical space. But uh, can we really emulate like um, a real strong gravity region? And I'll try to answer yes. And in order to uh, for you to believe in this answer, let us start with this kind of thought experiments. So first, let's assume that we have a homogeneous gravitational field pointing down. Okay, and we throw a ball. Of course, it would go up, decelerate, stop, go down. Uh, I mean, it's just well known what would happen when we do this experiment. Now, let's say uh, we are repeating the same experiment with light. Let's say we have created a uh, an empty waveguide with metal with, with metal walls. So and we are launching light into this waveguide. Of course, intuitively we know what will happen. Light will go up, will stop, go down. And of course, uh, uh, the reason why it would do something like this is because basically the behavior of light and in general electrodynamics in a gravitational field uh, is equivalent to uh, the behavior of light in an effective medium in which effective epsilon and effective mu are given by the component of the metric tensor, like the zero, zero, zero component of the metric tensor. Again, it's a pretty well-known effect, which you can see in all textbooks like landau Lifshitz. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, you know, what I show here in this uh, middle picture is that, okay, effectively, uh, you know, this half tones again, uh, effectively, when you start from, uh, from the bottom and go up, your effective refractive index decreases, your epsilon decreases, your mu decreases, so st you start at one and then it goes down. So what does it mean? So it means that your the optical bits of your waveguide is becoming smaller and smaller. So basically, it, in effect, it looks like a tapered waveguide, which is shown here. And in a tapered waveguide, light would do the same thing. It's very well, well known. You, you launch photon, it would go up, then it would reach the cutoff point, and then it would reflect and come back. So uh, again, uh, what we can see from this kind of thought experiment is that uh, basically in a waveguide subjected to a strong gravitational field, uh, light behaves like a massive particle and it does everything which a normal uh, ball would do. So uh, the effective mass of a photon in this situation would be defined by the dimensions of the waveguide. Uh, 
and actually the dispersion law looks like exactly like a dispersion law of a massive particle with effective mass defined by the waveguide dimensions. And of course, uh, effective mass of an electron in such a waveguide would be quite light, of the order of electron volts, if you're dealing with visible light, and normal uh, fiber, let's say. So uh, you are dealing with an effective kind of particle, uh, which is very light, uh, its mass is probably on the order of like 10 to the minus six of electron mass. So and this means that if you subject this very light particle to any kind of force, the accelerations will be huge. So again, let's continue our, uh, well, this will not be a description of a thought experiment. You know, you actually people do this experiments all the time in the lab. Uh, this are called experiments on photon scanning tunnel and microscopy. What you see in this picture here, you see a tapered fiber, which is coated with metal. Uh, the, uh, in the very end of the fiber is uh, cut off. So there is a little tiny subwavelength aperture here. And when people do photon scanning tunnel and microscopy experiments, they scan uh, this kind of probe on top of a uh, of a um, sample, and they acquire some wavelength information. So what they do, in fact, is they collect this kind of virtual uh, near-field photons, which are not actually real photons, uh, but uh, by virtue of expanding the waveguide, they convert uh, this uh, virtual near-field into a field which becomes a propagating wave inside the waveguide. So you are kind of create, creating uh, real photons from a virtual near field ones. And this is actually very similar to uh, the process of particle creation and gravitational field, the so-called gravitational field effect, which I will talk about a little bit later. But let's say you want to make this uh, analogy more precise. Okay, so what would you need to do? What kind of distribution of epsilon and mu would you need? So a particle moving in a constant gravitational field G uh, is described by this Rindler metric. Okay, uh, so effective epsilon and mu uh, would be uh, defined by this simple equation. So this means that if you dis, you know, if you created a distribution of epsilon and mu, uh, if you like, you know, which is given by the simple equation as a function of x. So uh, the, the particle of light you know, will not know. I mean, or it will be very basically it will be very confused. So I mean, you know, if we have this distribution of epsilon and mu, I get moving inside uh, metamaterial medium. Or you know, is it moving um, through vacuum and is it subjected to gravitational field? Okay, uh, so basically the motion would look very very similar, and uh, but at the very least you can create an accelerated motion of photons this way. So what would be the orders of magnitude of acceleration? Well. If you look at the numbers, uh, the numbers are okay. So this is like acceleration observed some, I mean, in different uh, physical situation in log scale, and uh, the bars represent typical acceleration near Earth, one G, near the sun surface, it's like hundred G, uh, near typical stellar black hole. Uh, the acceleration reaches numbers like 10 to the 11th to, to the 12th G. So if you plug in numbers, uh, which, I mean, the acceleration, uh, typical accelerations which are experienced by photons in a typical tapered fiber, you would get numbers on the order of like 10 to the 20th, 10 to the 21st. 
and you know, you actually, it's very easy to observe the experiment, and you know, you would see light distribution like this, and I will show you what it means in the next slide. Uh, but uh, basically, the typical acceleration actually will be on the order of uh, uh, basically group velocity times uh, derivative of group velocity. So on the order of like uh, c squared uh, times lambda. So if your lambda, I mean, over lambda, so if your lambda, your wavelength is very tiny, like in hyperbolic metamaterials, uh, you get even larger numbers. So the order of 10 to the 23, 10 to the 24 G. So uh, where would you see uh, this kind of acceleration in nature? Well, almost nowhere. Uh, the only other potential place where you would experience something like this would be a near hypothetic mini black hole, which we hypothesized to exist. Uh, to, to, to be created during the Big Bang, and maybe some mini black holes are still out there in nature. Uh, but uh, basically, the typical accelerations experienced by this photon quasi particles are huge. So we are really in a very, uh, very large acceleration regime. So uh, we may anticipate interesting new physics and the simple reason is that even like our basic laws of mechanics were verified somewhere here and not here uh, and uh, one other reason why you would expect interesting physics is because at such a huge accelerations the photons which move through the waveguide they experience vacuum around them, not as vacuum, but as a best of thermal radiation. This is called the Unruh effect. They will see the Unruh best of thermal radiation and uh, the Unruh temperature is directly proportional to acceleration. So uh, this kind of numbers, uh, the Unruh temperature would reach all the way up to like 10,000 Kelvin or more which is very, very large number. So how would you see this and what you would do in the experiment? So actually uh, the experiments are not difficult to do. And this is a real, uh, I mean, this is a relatively recent work from China by the group of Hu Liu. Uh, actually they created the tapered waveguide and you know, this was my experiment made in 2008. They did very similar thing like tapered waveguide. And of course, when uh, photons move through the tapered waveguide at such high accelerations, um, you see basically something very similar to a cherry of cone. So there is emission into the outside modes, um, into vacuum. And the cherry of cones, of course, uh, start to have different angles. Uh, you know, as, you know, the angle actually. Uh, changes uh, if the uh, acceleration uh, you know, increases. So actually, you can actually measure uh, the acceleration of a photon in a tapered waveguide and verify the basic equations and get the numbers, which look indeed huge, like 10 to the 19th G. This is kind of... So, I mean, uh, this I mean, it's very easy actually to achieve this kind of accelerations in a lab. Well, uh, what would you do? What would you expect uh, in such situation? Well, uh, you would probably see something like this, you know, uh, you know, the loss of coherence, first of all. And the reason why you would see the loss of coherence is because uh, you know, when you move with huge acceleration, uh, I mean, your eigenstates, you know, in uh, you know, based on Einsteinian perspective, this reference frame, they relate to a wave function in the regular reference frames kind of 
phase factor. And the problem is that so there is this term which is proportional to t cube and a squared, which means that uh, basically everything is screwed. Uh, your vacuum is screwed. So the Einsteinian and Newtonian wave functions, they belong to different Hilbert space, corresponding to very different quantum wave. So the very first thing which you would uh, expect to see in the taper wave guys is that you know initially coherent photons would look would, would lose coherence. So again, very interesting experiment, uh, probably of relevance to quantum communication people. Uh, but uh, another an experiment, I mean, an expectation would be, hello? Okay. Yeah, Igor, you, you're breaking up quite a bit at the moment. Um, oh, okay. Well, what, what you would suggest me to do? Do I need to repeat anything or? I would uh, suggest, hey, Charles is sunny, suggest stop sharing video. Yeah, okay, yeah, maybe uh, stop sharing your video and then just continue. Okay, let me see uh, if I. Okay, but I'm not. I'm not supposed to share my video, correct? Or what I'm supposed yeah, to? Yeah, the video that shows you. So on the bottom it says okay, start okay, or okay. stop video. Yeah, there, perfect. Okay, 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 okay. Thank you. Is it better? Yes, yes. Thank you. And what have you lost? Do I need to repeat myself? I think uh, this chart we didn't hear too much. Okay, so uh, basically. Uh, uh, the point of this chart is quite simple. So at such huge accelerations, you start to see the difference between kind of Newtonian wave functions in the initial reference frame and Einsteinian wave functions, uh, which are like in the you know, uh, supposed to be uh, more physically relevant in the free for free falling photons. So the correspondence between different reference frames is given here by this nonlinear phase factor. And of course, the trouble comes from this term. So everything is kind of scrambled and mixed because uh, over time and at huge accelerations, your, phase, your relative phases uh, go as t cube times a squared, which means that uh, Basically, you completely mix uh, like positive and negative frequencies in the relative uh, kind of reference frames. And uh, basically, the Einsteinian and Newtonian wave functions, they belong to completely different Hilbert spaces because it goes into different wave queue, which means that basically, if you are doing a kind of, I mean, a quantum communication experiment and your photons were, you know, you, basically, you would lose coherence very fast. So this is one way to see any a non-trivial experiment related to the UNRU temperature and to the UNRU effect. So basically, your entanglement will be lost very fast if you are trying to propagate uh, photons, entangled photons through a tapered wave guy. But there are actually other interesting effects to see if you believe that you do not know everything about nature. For example, uh, it was proposed, and actually quite a few people seriously look for uh, this new particles. Uh, you know, there is basically a complete zoo of particles, which was theoretically proposed. One of the most popular candidates would be Axion. It's a pseudo particle uh, with uh, effective mass on the order of 10 Kelvin. So of course, if your UNRU temperature is like 10,000 Kelvin, then you may start to see mixing between photons and axions. So in general, uh, basically, uh, let us see if we can observe an analog of Schwinger in effect in a strong accelerated in this, in a strongly accelerated reference frame. So uh, I guess everybody more or less familiar with the conventional uh, Schwinger effect. So if the electric field in vacuum is very large, then you may uh, pull apart a virtual electron and positron from each other, and you can create 
real particles you know, out of vacuum, if you feel, is strong enough. Of course, nobody actually was able to reach this kind of electric fields yet. This electric field is called the Schwinger electric field. And you, the fields which you need are the order of like 10 to the 18th volt per meter. But the good news is that with the gravitational field, uh, I mean, you may be getting close. If you believe in this you know, waveguide analogy, and of course, uh, homogeneous uniform gravitational field will not create any particles, but the tidal forces may actually do it. So conventional Schwinger effect uh, looks like this. So electron charge times time Schwinger field times the Copton wavelength of electron should be equal to mc squared. At this field strength, you would be able to create an electron and positron pair. So uh, in gravitational field, again, you know, homogeneous gravitational field will not do it, but the tidal forces may do it. So uh, basically, if you replace this simple formula for the Schwinger effect with the tidal forces, which is basically a gradient of G times Copton wavelengths, uh, you would get particle creation. So you basically may be talking about, first of all, the UNRU effect for axions. But then, of course, uh, it's not only UNRU effect, it's a Schrodinger effect may, which may contribute. And the type of, uh, again, so if you plug in the numbers, you're getting something very, at least, you know, uh, sufficient to uh, create such particle as axion if such particles exist. So uh, basically, uh, let us uh, think about the geometry of gravitational Schwinger effect. And again, I was uh, talking about it in the beginning when I was talking about photon scanning tunnel microscopy, where we are doing kind of similar things. But uh, because there is probably no doubt if you start with, let's say, a tapered waveguide, which is again equivalent to a waveguide subjected to a strong gravitational field. You put a mirror on top and on the bottom. Okay, you, you pump uh, your cavity, and uh, well, uh, all kind of uh, optical near field will be probably created. Uh, at the apex of your fiber. And if you cheat and if you make your mirror wavelength selective, you can actually uh, observe uh, Schwinger photons coming out of the uh, fatter end of the tapered fiber. And actually, it's very similar to what is happening in photon scanning you know, tunnel and microscopy, where you're not doing optical pumping, but you are just collecting virtual photons with your tapered fiber. But basically there is no doubt that you can create a quote unquote Schwinger laser like this. So you can uh, use an RB of doped fiber amplifier if you taper the fiber, uh, you can pump it and probably they will be a Schwinger photons coming out of this kind of strange laser. Or you can actually uh, use a tapered silicon and uh, you know silicon optical amplifier geometry uh, with to the same effect. So there is no doubt if you pump the system too much or if you drive it with electrical field, there would be Schwinger, you know, real Schwinger photons coming out of this end. So you will create a Schwinger laser. Of course, the interesting part is what is happening if the axion electrodynamics is true. And of course, there are materials, like solid state material systems. Uh, uh, the example is magnetoelectric antiferromagnetic chromia, which actually have, uh, uh, which have uh, axion quasi-particles in the solid state field, uh, system. But of course, uh, quite a few people suggest that similar axion field may exist in vacuum. So uh, 
the axial electrodynamics looks like, like this. It looks very much like normal macroscopic electrodynamics with an additional pseudoscalar axion field here. Otherwise, everything is normal. So uh, axions are believed to be reasonably strongly coupled to photons. Reasonably strongly means that basically, okay, so probably non vanishingly coupled to photons. And there are quite a few efforts. Uh, people are trying to uh, look for axions in optical cavities. So presumably our sun may be a source of axions again. Igor? Are you there, Igor? I think uh, we may have lost him. Or did I lose things? Can people hear me? That's we can hear you. Five, Charles. Yeah, okay, all right. Uh, he's probably still talking. and might not realize that uh, he's not transmitting. Um, I'll send him an email, I suppose. But he's not going to be looking at his email, so. Hmm. Charles, you can. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, oh, Igor? Me? Yeah, I have lost uh, power, whatever. For, I mean, OK, how much? Uh, do I, what do I need to repeat? Yeah, uh, you need to sh uh, share your slides again. OK, just a second. Yeah, I'm sorry about it. Oh, well, that's OK. Yeah, some computer glitch, basically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my computer decided to, to restart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, you had covered this slide here about the axion electrodynamics. Yes. So basically, the point is that, well, first of all, if you make a, a waveguide, a tapered waveguide like this out of uh, antiferromagnetic chroma, you would see axions coming out of your uh, kind of Schwinger laser. Yes. But the real question is, uh, okay, uh, I mean, can you create real axions this way? So, and of course, uh, well, uh, in principle, uh, you know, the axion photon mixing uh, is kind of known quantity. It should be resonant when the axion mass, which is again of the order of like 10 to the minus 3 EV, actually, it's, actually it sits somewhere in the gigahertz range. So if your effective mass of the photon matches uh, the axion, uh, you would have a resonance. And in fact, uh, people in, you know, who are making, uh, who are making this, who are doing these experiments with cavities, uh, they are trying to rely on this, uh, you know, axion photon resonance. They are slowly tuning the cavity and are searching for uh, signals in the gigahertz range, uh, trying to see a spike like this. And of course, the family of experiments would be uh, like light shining through the wall experiment. Again, the hope is that uh, you know you you know you couple to axions, and actually, uh, uh, the auxiliary magnetic field is very useful. Why the Primakov effect? Because basically, the, on the at the quantum level, uh, you have two uh, photons creating one. Uh, one axion and basically one photon may be represented by the magnetic field. So and basically the probability would probabilities would be larger. So again, it absolutely makes sense to use uh, tapered fibers for uh, this uh, experiments, which would attempt to see photon axion coupling because at some point there should be resonant coupling, which may be quite strong. Okay, so what would you see then? 
actually let me go several slides uh, up basically with this mirror kind of experiment of course you may you may lay you may you may let all the pump photons to be inside cavity but uh, uh, your axions will not see mirror as mirror they're going to go straight you know straight through so in principle uh, this uh, experiments on em drive may be reframed as an ex as experiments directed at axion searches so i mean mm -hmm. of course these experiments of course are not obviously easy and uh, the controversial results which people see in these experiments are actually well understood because the probabilities are low and thermal effects probably dominate but in principle if you pump a tapered optical cavity if you put energy in and you see some kind of thrust again hypothetically this may be an evidence of something like axions being created in such a inside of such a tapered uh, cavity but uh, actually the power of this experiment of this approach is actually it goes beyond like axion searches because I mean we are not really sure if axions are there uh, but uh, you know what else may be out there I mean people uh, talk about many different things like an axion electrodynamics is just one potential alternative uh, I mean people are talking about dark photons and complete zoo of all kind of strange supersymmetric extension of standard model but uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, this uh, way of uh, uh, basically measuring thrust or doing the slides through the wall experiment uh, shown here is actually quite agnostic as far as the nature of this unknown uh, potential hidden sector particle concerned you can search for anything it may not be necessarily axion uh well again uh let's say uh you want to believe that people who are trying to do em drive experiments i mean so i mean they actually you know they have some hope maybe it's real maybe not but how to optimize this experiment well i mean if uh, uh this theory this understanding is correct uh first of all the good recommendation would be to apply magnetic field perpendicular to the uh to the tapered waveguide cavity because then you are making use of the prima coefficient and your probabilities are much higher all of a sudden the coupling the axion photon coupling would be much higher and second of course uh, since uh, we need like uh, gradients of effective g and uh, we need to optimize our drive in terms of volume etc then uh, basically the scaling is well understood uh, the gradients of g would be one over lambda squared uh, volume with probably lambda cube so the thrust would be inversely proportional to lambda which means that you have better chance uh, detecting this effect if you go to smaller lambda so your resumed good correct uh, em drive experiment should be done in the visible domain with a sample like an array of tapered waveguides which is again not difficult to do uh, of course uh, if you want to compare uh, the typical uh, theoretical projection be the sensitivity of the current m drive experiments people report forces on the order of like one micronewton well uh, you know if this is your sensitivity limit that your power inside the cavity should be quite large of course you can kind of alleviate this problem by making lots of cavities uh, but basically my conclusion is 
well, it's already known. So most probably it will be a difficult experiment. Uh, and the uh, thermal effects will interfere a lot. And I guess I can stop now. Oh, great. Thank you very much, Igor. Um, so many interesting potential uh, thoughts from your work. Uh, do we have any questions for Igor? Well, let me put my video back on here. What do we think of this? Um, I was not aware of that paper out of China where they measured the accelerations. Um, well, which, they kind of repeated my experiments so 10 years ago, but it's fine. I see, I see. <laughs> the yeah. Barrier, the barrier. <laughs> uh huh, uh huh, right. Yeah, that's pretty. So, did you know Rivlin? Um, yes, I actually, I mean, uh, I published a couple of papers. Um, the, one of the recent ones published in Optics Letters, actually, I, I, cite, the, I cite him, yes. Yeah, you yeah, cite I mean, him, but uh, I was I mean, he was talking about effective uh, mass of a photon and a wave, right? I mean, uh, people, uh, I mean, people knew about this, I mean, I mean, since at least like 1920s, and uh, Louis de Broil was talking about it. Hmm. Yeah, I was just wondering if you actually happen to know him or not, personally. No, I don't know him personally, no. Uh. Okay, yeah, yeah. So before that, you're saying um, uh, De Broglie? De Broglie? Yep, yep. Was talking about the same sort of thing. Yep. Um, so in relation to the EM drive, uh, would it have to be an axion generation in order to generate the thrust, do you think? or? Would the acceleration of the photons in a tapered guide be able to, you know, just from, you know, a, a photon force, be able to generate uh, a force? Do you understand well, my question? I mean, I mean, I mean, well, I mean, I, no, no, I understand. Yeah, no, yeah, I understand. So again, in this treatment, uh, the photons and stuff they do not create. Uh, any kind of additional force, unless, of course, we do not know mechanics at this kind of accelerations. So basically, if you're talking about accelerations of the order of like 10 to the 24th uh, G, uh, nobody really tested normal mechanics at this kind of situations. So, you know, one agnostic answer is we do not know because we, we need to do to check just you know, the Newton's law in this kind of situation. Just F equals MA law. It would be a good idea yeah. to do this check. Well, but again, uh, uh, without any kind of uh, changes to basic mechanics and this kind of accelerations, uh, then, uh, I mean, interaction with uh, axions or some cold dark matter or something axion-like uh, would be a possibility. First of all, again, when you move through the fire, through the, I mean, when you move through the wave, right, it's such an acceleration. So you see this kind of ocean of axions, let's call them this way, uh, around you. Uh, just the, the vacuum around you is, is a sea of axions, not just the sea of uh, uh, photons anymore. Then, of course, because your accelerated motion is not homogeneous, you, you have a gradient of acceleration, you have like finger effect. And then on top of it, I mean, people believe that this cold dark matter is everywhere around us. And then, of course, uh, if you are in resonance with axions, you can imagine photons swimming in the sea of axions. You are kind of pushing against this sea of cold dark axions, which would create a you know, thrust. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, basically the theory, which by the way is published in uh, European uh, physics letters, um, I mean, it's all normal in all respects. So I respect uh, the basic laws of mechanics, even though, you know, I can say that, well, uh, they have not been checked, but I mean, it respects every known law of physics and the only assumption 
uh, here in this series, which is, by the way, is made by many assumptions, and some of them is like Fred Wilczek from MIT, uh, actually put forward this theory of axions a while back, like probably 30 years ago. So, I mean, uh, axions are the leading dark matter candidates and presumably believe in the sea of axions everywhere around us. So like we are this 5% of normal matter. We are not quite aware of the 95% of you know, matter, which yeah. is just here. And of course, if you know how to switch this, uh, uh, how to switch this mechanical force of interaction on and off, you can try to swim in the sea of dark matter. Mm -hmm. And then you I think uh, George, I think George yeah. has a question. Yes, uh, can you hear me, Igor? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm sorry I got in a little late, uh, but you have two diagrams of uh, photon. One in uh, a tapered waveguide where the photons are bashing against the wall yep. at some large acceleration, and the later one where there's a tapered and the photon flow is this way. Um, what about if, if the acceleration of the photons are, is so great, what ha, what's the Cherenkov radiation possibility off of the walls? Um, could you not use that as a detector of acceleration? Well, yes, uh, that's what's exactly what was done in this Chinese paper, which was published uh, literally like about one year ago, very recently. So they, you, I mean, uh, what they see, they made this cavity walls uh, kind of semi-transparent. There is a coupling to the outside photons, and they literally observe the Cherenkov cones, and they see that the Cherenkov cone angle changes, which means that uh, photons are being accelerated. So Thank this you. is a very clear, clean experiment showing accelerated motion of photons inside the wavelet. And by the way, the numbers are huge. Yeah, I just uh, I put in the chat that uh, Ido Kaminar has recently analyzed some data, accelerator data, and believes he has some evidence of unruh radiation. Um, and um, so I put that into the chat. Might be a paper you might want to take a look at. Sure, sure. Yeah. And I think Eric had a question. Yes. Hello, Igor. Uh you know, you, you look at a hydrogen atom and a photon comes in and ionizes it. Uh, the, the photons absorb and you're left with the electron. Uh, you have to look at that as a classical uh, event. Now, you know, you, you, when you have a waveguide or a mirror, the, the photon is not bouncing off of anything. It's, it's interacting with uh, the electron shells in the material and you, and you get a completely different photon uh, coming out after it hits a wall or, a, uh, or a, even a mirror. And um, so the question is that the, the Cherenkov radiation seems to me that it, it would be coming from electrons that are jarred out through uh, uh, you know, either auger electrons or whatever they may be, because the, the only, uh, uh, Cherenkov radiation that I'm familiar with is uh, when an electron <clears throat> travels faster than the speed of light in a material, um, like in a nuclear reactor. Uh, I, 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 you're saying that the photons are generating the Cherenkov radiation? Well, yeah, yeah, you can look up this genius paper. I mean, what I'm saying, it's not like Cherenkov, it's literally, it's not literally Cherenkov radiation, but the effect itself is very similar to the Cherenkov radiation. Uh, and again, my biggest statement is that, uh, again, and, and it's a very well-known statement which can be found in Landau Lifshitz volume two, that electrodynamics in a strong gravitational field is equivalent to uh, electrodynamics in some particular distribution of uh, epsilon and mu, the primitivity and permeability, uh, which is basically defined by the gravitational field. So the effects are literally indistinguishable. Well, I mean, so the, the photon is simply passing through a gradient of, uh, of per permittivity and, and permeability that's changing, right? Yes. And so the speed of light equals one over the square root of those two things multiplied. 
and and so that that is uh, that that is the apparent uh, acceleration because it's it's the speed of light is changing within the material, but it's still the, the photons are still uh, smacking into electrons and new photons are being released, and that's where the heat comes from, right? Uh, and and so I'm just trying to get an idea of because when when the photons are coming the other way. Um, they're, they're slowing, you know, they're, they're decelerating, right? Because they're coming back into a permeability that's closer to the vacuum. Uh, I, I think the reason the photons would go through the wall is simply the same reason why FM uh, radio photons go through bridges and AM photons don't, because, uh, you know, the smaller the, uh, the wavelength, the, the more likely you are to interact with the bonds and the electrons in the, uh, in the atoms because they're, they're approximately the same uh, wavelength, same size as the, uh, you know, as the bonds that they're hitting, right? It, I mean, photons uh, travel through, you know, uh, through your body, right? Because they're, they're, they're larger than uh, what they would need to interact with the bonds and the, and the electrons. I, I, I'm just trying to really understand if the photons are actually accelerating or whether this is all um, based on and the photons, you know, uh, knocking electrons into different energy orbitals, and then new photons are being released at a at a given um, at, a, at a given distribution, angular distribution. I, I don't well, know if I mean, that matters or not in terms well, of design. Well, I mean, at some at some level, in my opinion, it doesn't matter. So you can you can basically, I mean, okay, the photons, electrons, these are names which or whatever shorthands for uh, uh, fundamental excitation of the system so if you have a dielectric waveguide then of course the fundamental excitations of the systems which as a shorthand we call photons are uh, you know you may you may you know, validly uh, claim that they consist of all kind of other degrees of freedom you know in the material be it electronic degrees of freedom, atomic degrees of freedom, whatever. But at the theoretical kind of mathematical level, so you have a system, you have its fundamental degrees of freedom, they are quantized. So, uh, well, and what we call photon is, you know, it's just basically the degree of freedom of the system. But but what I, the last thing I want to say is that these these Schwinger photons and I'm not from you know I this is not my area of expertise but they are getting through the wall simply because their wavelength is getting larger. No, no I'm not arguing this. I'm saying that yeah. mathematically it does. I mean uh, this argument. I mean to me mathematically this argument does make sense. So I have the degrees of freedom and I can call them whatever. Okay. So like all these photons actions, these are names invented to as a, as designations to some degrees of system of you know some degrees of freedom of some complicated system uh -huh. and that's all okay. i need to know okay yeah i, I like that i like the way of thinking about that yeah the photon the, the, is a degree reality, of freedom the, the only reality that you have which is instrumentation is the interaction you have between electrons and quarks in the form of protons and things of that sort you have an interaction of nothing else. There's no such thing in that sense as a photon. There are these electrons, and as you said, they have, they go to different states, and that's what your instrumentation detects. Period. So the sure. issue the issue that's always mixed up is number one: what typically are the si are the wavelengths of the photons that you're talking about in your various experiments? Well, again, uh, in the in the tapered fiber experiments, okay, this would be. Uh, like if you're talking about visible photons, the wavelengths yeah. would be like half a micron, plus minus whatever. So in the hyperbolic metamaterial waveguide, uh, the wavelengths may be considerably short. It may go down all the way to like 50 nanometers, 100 nanometers. So it can, can be considerably shorter. Yeah, but again, it's a you know it's a mode of the system, and. Um, well, uh, we can argue about the nature of it, but uh, the photons uh, which propagate through the tapered waveguides, they do 
emit something which looks very similar to chilling of radiation. So, okay, not to repeat uh, myself, but to repeat myself, the two things that are going on, in fact, this might respond to what Eric's saying, is that that's often not talked about uh, or not talked about directly, is number one, pho photon regeneration. And photon regeneration simply means that the photon ends its life by accelerating a charge and in accelerating the charge, that charge then produces another photon. And so you have photon regeneration. And then the second one is just the, the visualization of these photons uh, and as you see with these gigantic wavelengths that are, that are 10,000 times the size of the atomic spacing in the matter that it's dealing with. So, so, so if you have those two visualizations, namely regeneration of photons, which it must be going on all the time, every time it terminates on a charge and regenerate it. And second of all, the fact that these photons, if you think of them as waves, are 10,000 times or so larger than the interspacing of the atoms, 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus 10 meters, then all of a sudden that, that view doesn't seem to get in. It's fine, but whatever, I mean, let's call it entity. I mean, because in the end, we are arguing about things and the next. So let's call it an entity. So an entity which moves through the waveguide with visibly huge acceleration is creating real physical effects which are observable in the lab. Good. So I love that. This way. I love that. Let's yeah. get around those confusing yeah. words and get back down to what it is. Very good. Thank you.